Corporation question mark. I had immense trouble with the editors. <laughs> the editor said, you can't put a question mark in your <laughs> title. Probably because of a theorem that uh, um, Scott Tremaine told me, namely, whenever you have a, a title with a question mark, the answer is always no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this was a genuine question mark. I was really asking, you know, could one use water flow or something like that, fluid flow, in order to test ideas about black holes? Could one actually see this thermal radiation being given off by a fluid flow? Over the years, many, many different systems have been shown to behave in exactly the same way. Waves and fluid, electromagnetic waves and wave guides or fibers. They all obey the same equations as Hawking's at low frequencies. They all differ at high frequencies or short wavelengths. One of the things we can do is to use this to test the dependence of the effect of the thermal radiation on the short wavelength physics. If I change the short wavelength physics, does that change the thermal radiation? After all, Hawking's derivation relied on this e to the 10 to the fifth, which was silly. Here we've got a chance of looking at a system which doesn't rely on e to the 10 to the fifth. Does one still get the thermal radiation? Well, one of the uh, systems that Ralph Schutzhold and I suggested was fluid flow. So here we've got some water flowing over uh, an obstacle. The water has to flow faster over the obstacle. Uh, in order to flow faster, of course, it has to slide downhill. So the water surface gets depressed over the obstacle so that the water can you know, speed up as it goes downhill and then slows down again and goes uphill on the other side of the obstacle. We've got a black hole horizon over here, i.e. this is a horizon where low frequency sound waves cannot get out. This fluid is flowing faster than the velocity of sound, and so the wave can't get out of this horizon. This is a white hole horizon, which is a horizon into which waves cannot travel. This is just the time inverse of this. So any physics that one does for a black hole horizon, the same kind of physics should apply to a white hole horizon. And about five years ago, a group at University of British Columbia, Silke Weinfurtner was a theoretical postdoc of mine. Ted Tedford was a just graduated civil engineer, a graduate student. Matt Penrice was an undergraduate student at UBC. Uh, there was me, who's a theorist, and Greg Lawrence, who's a civil engineering professor. So it's a strange group of people. No experimental physicists in there. There were, however, experimental civil engineers in there, which was extremely important. This is what the experiment looks like. I like this diagram because this diagram could have occurred in a 19th century physics textbook, right? Same kind of idea. What we have here is a flume, uh, side walls made out of uh, plexiglass. There's an obstacle. The fluid uh, is pumped by this pump from a tank around here through the screen and over the, over the obstacle. There's a wave generator here, which sends waves towards the white hole horizon, and we are going to measure uh, what comes out. This is basically a stimulated emission experiment. It's not a spontaneous emission. It's stimulated emission. But Einstein taught us back in 1919 that for a quantum system, the stimulated emission and the, and the spontaneous emission are very, very closely related to each other. If you understand how stimulated emission works, you understand how the <coughs> spontaneous emission works. To measure the surface of the fluid, 
uh, all kinds of ideas, but this was one of the things that uh, Ted Tedford, because he'd done things like this in his degree, brought. What we did was we filled the water full of a rhodamine dye. It's a sort of a uh, reddish, pinkish fluid. And shone a green laser, just like this one, which we spread out into a thin sheet onto the surface of the water. The rhodamine dye is such that when it's hit by this laser, it fluoresces, which is good because, as you know, lasers have huge amounts of speckle. If you look at a little laser dot, you see all these little speckles of light, which make it very difficult to figure out exactly how much light there is. This uh, fluorescence, of course, wipes out all of that speckle. Furthermore, the laser light would have just gone into the water or been reflected off, and you couldn't see where it was. This way, however, the fluorescence goes in all directions, and you can photograph it from the side. Furthermore, there was enough rhodamine in there so that the mean free path of the green light into the water was less than a millimeter. Uh, rhodamine is an extremely good absorber for this green laser light. So one could very, very accurately, to better than a tenth of a millimeter, measure where the surface of the water was. This is an example. Uh, this is a picture taken from the pixels of the camera. The pixels you can see as these little squares. I've expanded it in the vertical direction so that the number of pixels vertically is much less than the number of pixels horizontally. And at first you'd say, well, you can't do any better than one pixel. But if you look, you see that this is brighter, this is dimmer above it, this is dimmer. You can fit that to a parabola and figure out exactly where the brightest point should be uh, in that light and measure the surface to much better than a single pixel to about a fifth of a, a fit between a fifth to a tenth of a pixel. This is an example of the dispersion relationship. This was a picture we took, and then we Fourier transformed it in space and in time of just noise on the surface of the water. And we find that that noise has very definite relationship between the frequency and the wave number. This is the uh, uh, spatial wave number, and this is the uh, temporal frequency. There's this very definite relationship between the wave number and the frequency, which is just the dispersion relationship. This is with the fluid flowing, and as we notice, the fluid, uh, the dispersion relationship is different for the waves which are traveling with the fluid versus those waves which are traveling against the fluid. So one can do measurements on this system. This is an example of the Fourier transform. Um, we Fourier transformed in time, picked out exactly that frequency that we were running the generator at, and then at that frequency, we looked at the spatial Fourier transform and we notice that there are basically three peaks here. This peak is the incoming radiation, which has a very, very long wavelength. The longest wavelength we used has a wavelength of about uh, 20 meters. Much, much bigger than our tank. Our whole tank was only five meters long. The lit surface was only two meters long. So this is not resolved. None of these waves uh, uh, are basically resolved. However, when the waves come near that white hole horizon, their frequency gets shifted up, their wavelength gets compressed, until finally it's compressed so much that now the velocity of the uh, wave is less than the velocity of the fluid, and it gets swept upstream. So these are the waves that come out being swept upstream. And we notice that there are two different kinds of waves. There's negative wave number waves. These turn out to be uh, in the so-called Bogolyubov uh, analysis. 
the so-called negative norm or negative frequency waves. These are the positive frequency waves. And the ratio between this and this tells us how many particles would be created if this were a quantum system. In fact, if we take the ratio of this to this squared and take the logarithm of that, the Hawking prediction would be that this should be a straight line if we plot it versus frequency. Well, that straight line is directly related to the temperature. And that temperature should be directly related to the derivative of c squared minus v squared, uh, according to the analysis. Well, I think you agree that that's a pretty good straight line. The temperature this corresponds to is about 10 to the minus 12 Kelvin. So I don't know about the water in Taiwan, but at least in Vancouver, it's really hard to have water at 10 to the minus 12 Kelvin. So one is never going to be able to see the spontaneous emission in this experiment. But we've done the stimulated emission. And Einstein told us that when you know the stimulated emission, you know what the spontaneous emission is. And the spontaneous emission would simply be the Hawking radiation. And this tells us that the Hawking radiation would have, to have a temperature of about 10 to the minus 12 Kelvin. And when you take the derivative of c squared minus v squared, one gets about 10 to the minus 12 Kelvin. They agree to within about 50%, which just absolutely and utterly astonished us. We never expected to get such good results. So the critical frequency, i.e., that came from dv by dx through all the derivative of c squared minus v squared, is somewhere between 0.08 and 0.18 hertz. What we measured for that slope of the line was 0.125 hertz. And I think that's pretty good agreement. To what extent is this an observation of Hawking radiation? It's the question I will leave for you. If one believes quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, then this measured behavior of the system stimulated emission directly implies the Hawking flux of thermal radiation of quantum noise if one could only measure it. Can one measure it directly? Can one actually see the quantum noise? And there have been a couple of, uh, of, of attempts to do this. One was Faccio in the paper Belgiorno et al. in 2010, who uh, sent an intense laser pulse into a piece of silica glass and uh, claimed to see radiation coming out to the sides, which they suspected was the Hawking radiation. It turns out the numbers don't really add up. There's something else going on there. And it turned out that the intensity of the light that they had to send in to make this sort of traveling black hole was so much that if you increased it by less than 50%, you could hear the pulse travel through the glass. And you could see a little brown streak left behind by the pulse traveling through the glass i.e. one was getting right to the breakdown of the silica glass. He's now trying to redo this experiment using diamond, uh, but I haven't heard of any results recently. Jeff Steinhauer in, 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 in uh, Israel has done experiments with, uh, Bo, uh, with, uh, with uh, Bose-Einstein condensates. In, nine, in 2014, he reported seeing the la black hole laser phenomenon. Uh, you have an intense beam of, uh, sorry, in this case, you, uh, oh, this is the fast way. This is the Faccio experiment. Let me not, uh, how am I doing for time? I won't, uh, yeah. 
So in the Faccio experiment, what he did was he shone a very intense beam, a laser beam, down a, uh, the, his, uh, his piece of glass. Because of the nonlinearities, that reduces the refractive index inside this pulse. And the pulse was traveling. He could make the pulse travel fast enough that the, refract, that the uh, velocity of light inside here was less than the speed at which this thing was traveling along. If one goes into the frame of the pulse, that looks exactly like a fluid, i.e. the glass fiber, flowing through a system, and one has decreased the velocity of light just inside this pulse in such a way that one gets a black hole and a white hole, uh, a black hole and a white hole horizon. In order to have the pulse travel fast enough, he used what's called a Bessel pulse, which uses a, a, one of those features of special relativity that we all uh, learn to play with, uh, namely the, the scissors. Remember that when you learn special relativity, you learn nothing can travel faster than light. And then somebody says, but wait, let's assume I have this huge long pair of scissors, which I go ahead and close. Then that point of intersection, if they're long enough, is going to travel faster than light if the angle between the blades is small enough. Well, you can do that with light as well. And what he did was he had a prism. This is supposed to be uh, circularly symmetric in this direction. You send in a pulse of light here. It gets refracted in by the prism. It, you get these two pulses here that intersect. And this intersection point is traveling faster than the velocity of either of the, of the light in either of these beams. So you can arrange for the center. And remember that this, because it's of the circular symmetry, the center is extremely bright. You can arrange that that center is traveling faster than the light is traveling in this piece of glass. And that's his uh, black, that produces his black hole, white hole pair. Uh, Steinhauer instead of using this kind of light, used a Bose-Einstein condensate and basically had it run over a waterfall as I had before. Now, one of the things that uh, Ted Jacobson and Corley uh, showed about 20 years ago was one can actually get an instability in this kind of situation where the pulse bounces back and forth between the two horizons, the white hole and the black hole horizon. Every time it hits the black hole horizon, you get uh, a low frequency wave coming out. And more of it comes out as created at low frequencies than at high frequencies. So in, in his case, the way in which he made it is uh, he put in a, a laser beam onto the, this is a Bose-Einstein condensate. He put in a laser beam. He made one edge of it a very sharp by putting in a razor blade that the laser beam had to go by before it hit the Bose-Einstein condensate. Uh, the light inside here attracts the Bose-Einstein condensate. And as a result, you get a higher density in here and a different velocity of sound uh, traveling inside that uh, place, which is illuminated by the laser beam. Here's his example. This is uh, inside the laser beam. It's actually lower density, not higher. Uh, so here it is. It's moving along. The velocity of sound in a Bose-Einstein condensate is about a few millimeters per second. So it's not too hard to move that spot along the Bose-Einstein condensate to make a white hole, black hole type kind of pair. And what you notice is these little striations here are getting stronger and stronger as you go down. There's an instability. And that instability turns out to be due exactly to the same kind 
of idea as one has for, um, uh, for the black hole. This is just the plot of the velocity of the fluid versus the velocity of, uh, of sound in the fluid. And you notice that inside the Bose-Einstein, inside that region, uh, you get one being bigger than the other. I won't go through the details, but here is just an example. This is a little movie illustrating this uh, instability. On each reflection from the black hole horizon, basically one picks up a thermal factor. At low frequencies, the thermal factor is just 1 over omega. What does 1 over omega mean in the Fourier transform? That's an integral. If you take an integral of a function, then in the Fourier transform space, that's the same as multiplying the function by 1 over omega. So every time this pulse hits the, black, uh, hits the black hole horizon, it gets integrated. Here's a little example. This is the black hole horizon. You can see the pulse coming out here now only has up and down. Now is a single bump. Now is a step function. Then begins to be a parabola. And if you could keep going, it would then become not a parabola, but a, a cubic, a fourth order, etc. Each time it hits the black hole horizon, you get an integral. The reason that those pulses disappeared, can you actually see this? Mm. Yeah, I can see. Just about. <laughs> there's a step for here. I'm sorry, but it's, uh, it's very clear on here. <laughs> This is just an illustration of that uh, instability that Steinhauer was seeing, which is caused by precisely that Hawking behavior, that thermal behavior every time the pulse hits the black hole horizon. Every time the pulse comes along, some little fluctuation comes along, it gets this extra integral stuffed into it. And that's what gives you that instability that he saw in his experiment. Whether or not that initial fluctuation was quantum noise is still very much of an open question. He argues that it is. He's uh, got a very recent paper just a few days ago. When I did this, this was four days ago. This is now about a month ago. Uh, again, he can uh, build using a laser beam just as the last time. He can have a system in which the density is much higher here, which is outside. Here's the horizon, and here's inside. So he's making a black hole horizon here. And what he's doing is instead of directly, thank you, instead of directly trying to see the radiation, is he's looking at correlations in the sound waves given off uh, by that horizon. The horizon is essentially at x equals 0 and x prime equals 0. And what this is is the density-density correlations across the horizon. If you look here, you see this nice straight line. What this is telling you is that the fluctuations on one side of the horizon are correlated with the fluctuations on the other side of the horizon. That's exactly what the Hawking process would have predicted. Every time you make a particle, a Hawking particle going out, you make another one also inside the horizon that eventually in the black hole case ends up in the singularity. In this case, it just ends up in the different region of that Bose-Einstein condensate. This is taking a cut. This is what the uh, profile looks like. If you look at that density, density distribution uh, across this slice here. And he argues that the width of this gives him the thermal factor. 
And he argues that he could even tell that the two, uh, that the fluctuations are entangled on the two sides. I don't understand that argument yet. I've been trying hard, but I'm still very confused. But what we see is that he is at least, at the very least, incredibly close to actually seeing the Hawking thermal radiation in this Bose-Einstein condensate system. What's really astonishing is that he seems to work alone. He doesn't have a big group. He does, I mean, he's obviously had graduate students that helped him, helped him originally set up the system, but he seems to work alone and have derived all of these results on his own. What I hope I've conveyed to you here is that analog systems may, pro may provide us a very rich area in which one could do experiments and perhaps those experiments to, can give one a clue as to what's going on in Hawking radiation. After all, these systems don't have that e to the 10 to the fifth problem, which suggests that Hawking's original derivation, which required it, well, that requirement was just, you know, not really there. One can make hand-waving arguments about adiabaticity, that the high-frequency stuff sees this background changes as being adiabatic, so it stays in the vacuum. And any system in which that's going to work is always going to produce thermal radiation. But the nice thing here is one actually can do experiments, which might give one an insight as to what is going on here. Thank you. Open for questions. I'm a little bit confused that uh, these are all classical waves. So does it really capture everything with quantum? Although you say the equation in this way is similar. Right. So the, I mean, in the original, in the water case, the argument goes as follows, that uh, the equations are exactly the same. The linearized you know, sound wave equations are the same as, as they were in the Hawking case. Um, and that the, the measurements that we did were looking at the stimulated emission. It's, if you will, classical, but are looking at the stimulated emission of the system. We then go to Einstein, who taught us that if quantum mechanics is correct, if you believe in quantum mechanics, then stimulated emission is very directly tied to spontaneous emission. The Hawking effect is the spontaneous emission of the black hole uh, of these quanta of the, uh, of the scalar field in, in Hawking's original calculation. So that's why, and in fact, if you look at Hawking's original calculation, it's a classical calculation. It's not a quantum one. And some people sort of said, how can this? But basically, he used that same argument that once you look at the quantum mechanics, the quantum mechanics is completely determined by the stimulated emission that you calculate in the classical system. In this, in, for example, Steinhauer's calculation, Steinhauer would be arguing it's better than that because in his case, the little fluctuations that he's seeing uh, in the presence of this horizon of his Bose-Einstein condensate are actually being amplified, if you will, by that horizon to become large-scale quantum fluctuations. They're not just classical. It's not stimulated emission. He's directly looking at the spontaneous emission of sound waves by this horizon in the Bose-Einstein condensate. So his, is a, his, if you will, is a much more direct experiment uh, detecting the quantum uh, emission of this horizon than the water tank experiments that we carried out. If you believe quantum mechanics, they're equivalent to each other. Who here doesn't believe quantum mechanics? 